Again, we are in the series, Mark the Urgent Gospel, and we're issuing this Good News Challenge. It's a 16-week challenge um, where we give you a challenge for the week, and there's a list of challenges on the Good News Challenge card, and you can pick one of those up at the information booth. And as you do each challenge, we want to know about it, and so we're asking you to put stickers on the map that you saw as you passed in here, um, stickers on that map, and there's a sticker that's appropriate for each of the week's challenge. Uh, last week's challenge was at the end of every day, spend time confessing the sins of your day before God. And again, adults, youth, and kids all have their own maps, and we've told people you cannot work ahead, but you can catch up, and you can even begin this week uh, if you so desire. It's not too late to start. And again, look at the map as you come in and come out to see the impact that we are making in the Magic Valley. This week's uh, challenge is going to come from Mark chapter 8, and we've asked Joe Shaw to read the Scripture. So, Joe, if you can make your way on up there, and as he does so, if the rest of you who are able to please stand and face the center of the room. And we face the center of the room as a reminder to us, and read from the center of the room, because it's a reminder to us of where Scripture should be in our lives. It should be central to our lives, both as individuals and as a community of faith. And so, Joe, whenever you are ready, if you can read from Mark chapter 8. Jesus and his disciples went to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with the disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? And what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them, when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Thank you, Joe. You may be seated. This story takes place in what is labeled in the, in the Scripture as the villages around the area of Caesarea Philippi. And just want to show you where that is. If you... Uh, Look on the map here. Here's Israel. You have Bethlehem is towards the south. Jerusalem's just right by Bethlehem. Here is the Dead Sea there. Mediterranean Sea is there. Galilee, the Galilean region, is right up there. And Caesarea Philippi is at the very top of the map. It's about 25 miles north of Galilee. And Galilee, just as a reminder, (coughs) is the place where Jesus did most of his earthly Ministry. Now, Caesarea Philippi was built by someone named Herod Philip. Uh, Herod Philip, he named it Caesarea because he wanted to honor Caesar, but there already was a Caesarea in, the, um, in Israel. On, actually, there is a Caesarea. It's actually on the map. It's right there on the coast of the Mediterranean. And, um, and so since there was already a Caesarea, Philip wanted to distinguish it from that one, and so he called it Caesarea Philippi. Now, Herod Philip was one of the sons of Herod the Great. Herod the Great is the Herod from the Christmas story. So if you're familiar with the Christmas story and the Herod from the Christmas story, 
Herod Philip is one of his sons. Now, just a couple of quick pictures of uh, Caesarea Philippi. The first one is one that's um, taken from today, and these are obviously the ruins of Caesarea Philippi. Part of Caesarea Philippi was at the base of this cliff, and um, on the base of this cliff were many shrines, many temples, and I'll talk about that in a second, what those temples and shrines were for. But you will also see a cave there in the picture, and you see water flowing. You see the water in the foreground there flowing back in that day from the cave that's in the background. And if you remember from a couple weeks ago, water is understood in this culture in this day as an entryway into the abyss, the abyss, the place where the demons and other evil spirits live. And so this cave with the water flowing from it was referred to as the gates of hell because it's an entryway into the abyss. Now, another picture, this is actually, this next picture is an artist's rendition of what that cliff area looked like back in the day of Caesarea Philippi, and you will see those temples and shrines. Now, those temples were all temples to a god whose name was Pan. Pan, the god Pan, and the worship of the god Pan is where we get our word pandemonium. That kind of gives you an idea of what the worship of Pan was like. It was pandemonium. It was a place, Caesarea Philippi was a place of self-indulgence of all the worst kinds. It was a place where you did what you wanted to do. Whatever you want to do, go ahead and do it here in Caesarea Philippi. If you remember a couple weeks ago, I talked about a city in the Galilean region called Hippus, where Jesus went and healed a man who was demon-possessed. And I said, when you think of Hippus, think Vegas. Well, if you think of Caesarea Philippi, Vegas won't do. It's much worse than that. Okay, um, just one illustration. I don't want to get overly graphic, but bestiality was not uncommon in the worship of Pan. That's the kind of stuff that happened in Caesarea Philippi. And if you think about a place like Hippus that we talked about a couple weeks ago, you think about a place like Caesarea Philippi, interesting places that Jesus takes his disciples. Fascinating where Jesus chooses to take his disciples when he's talking about what their mission is going to be. Now, it's, at this, it's in this region that Peter makes his confession of Jesus as Messiah or Jesus as the Christ. Peter says to him when Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, you are the Messiah. And then Jesus warns them, not to tell anyone about him. You see, people are wondering, is, who is Jesus? Is he, he's made a name for himself. Could he be the expected Messiah? Is he a prophet? Is he Elijah? Is, who is he? And Jesus has that conversation with his disciples. And this moment of what we just read, it's a pivotal moment in the ministry of Jesus. It's a great moment and Peter actually gets it. Peter's usually the guy we make fun of because he doesn't get it. But Peter gets it this time. And he says, Jesus, you are the Messiah. And the first thing Jesus says is, well, don't tell anybody. What? What? Don't tell anybody? Why shouldn't we tell anybody? You're the Messiah, aren't you? Why not? Well, you see, there were certain expectations that people had of the Messiah. The Messiah was going to be a savior. He was going to change the world. And there are expectations that the Jewish people had of what the Messiah was going to do. One of those expectations was the Messiah is going to bring peace. The Messiah is going to change the world in such a way that there is this universal, worldwide peace. 
But in addition to bringing peace to the whole world, the Messiah was going to reestablish the Davidic kingdom. Now in Israel's history, the house of King David, King David was the greatest king in all of Israel's history. It was the good old days of Israel. Remember when David was king and they would tell stories and all this history of how powerful and influential Israel was under King David and how it expanded. Well, the expectation was the Messiah was going to reestablish that because that had been lost. And a part of reestablishing the Davidic kingdom meant getting rid of the Romans. The Romans were the superpower of the world. And they were cruel. They were cruel in their dominion. Terribly cruel. And they occupied and controlled Israel. And so naturally, if the Messiah is going to come and reestablish the Davidic kingdom and bring peace, he's going to overthrow the Romans. But Jesus comes and he needs to adjust their expectations because Jesus was not going to fulfill these expectations in the way that they thought it was going to be done. You see, the people in all their study of Scripture had missed something. And Jesus didn't want that misunderstanding to spread. And so Jesus introduces a foreign concept to them, a foreign concept about who the Messiah is and what the Messiah will do. And that foreign concept was the suffering, the rejection, and the death of the Messiah. It says, Jesus spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. How far off is this concept off of their radar screen that Peter feels confident enough to rebuke Jesus? This whole idea of a Messiah suffering and being rejected and dying Everybody knows what the Messiah is going to do. Jesus, you're off your rocker. You've got this all wrong. Their expectation was so embedded into them that even after this, they still don't get it even later in Jesus' ministry. Luke 18, verses 31 to 34. They are about to enter Jerusalem. For the last time, Jesus and his disciples. And Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him, and they will flog him and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. And then read their response. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them. And they did not know what he was talking about. This was not the first time he'd introduced this. But their expectations were so ingrained in them that when he talks about it again, they're still clueless. Jesus had spent three years with them. He had already explained this to them. They still didn't know what he was talking about. And even 20 or 30 years later, while the disciples got it, the other Jewish people still, this whole idea of a Messiah suffering was a foreign concept to them. And actually to this day, the Jewish people don't accept Jesus because, well, he died. And he didn't establish a thing in their eyes. But the Apostle Paul, we read in the book of Acts, he goes into a synagogue, a place where the Jews worship, 
It's a synagogue in a city called Thessalonica, which is in modern-day Greece. And again, this is 20 or 30 years after Jesus' resurrection. And just look at this from Acts chapter 17. This is Paul now. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue. And on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving what? That the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. But for three consecutive Sundays, that's three consecutive, well, Saturdays, three consecutive weeks, three consecutive Sabbaths, he goes in and all he talks about is how the Messiah had to suffer. Because this was a completely foreign concept. He had to explain and prove about the sufferings of the Messiah and how Jesus fulfilled it. Now, we can easily make fun of the Jewish people for not getting it and poo-pooing them and all that stuff, but it makes me wonder, what expectations about Jesus that are deeply embedded in us do we have wrong? Because, again, these people were deeply devout to the faith. They weren't idiots. They weren't spiritual morons, in a sense. They were devout. So if they could miss something, it makes me wonder, what could we miss? Jesus teaches in this passage that following Jesus as the Messiah, first of all, is not about you. <laughs> Following Jesus as the Messiah is not about us. It's about Jesus and the gospel. He says, anyone who wants to be my disciple must deny themselves for me and the gospel. We deny ourselves because it's not about us. See, one expectation and one thing that we do to try to convince people to follow Jesus, and we have good intentions, but we say, hey, follow Jesus, and you'll be happier, and, you know, your hopes will be met, and Jesus can help you meet your dreams and goals and all that stuff. Make you happy. And then, I don't know if you ever do this, but do you ever find yourself bargaining with God? Hey, God, I'm doing some of the stuff that you want me to do. How about you do some of the stuff I want you to do? Help me out here. Throw me a bone. Do something. God, I'll do this if you do that. Now, God, I've been coming to church, and I pray, and I worship, and I try to be good and follow everything you want me to do. So because of that, what do we expect God to do? God, I'm holding up my end of the bargain. You need to hold up your end of the bargain. Isn't that why I'm doing this? Well, according to Jesus, that's not how it works. It's not about us. Which then begs the question, if it's not about us, why do we follow? <laughs> What's in it for me? Well, God wants you to be a part of his kingdom. Part of something bigger than you. And while your dreams and goals may not be fulfilled, being a part of God's kingdom is by far better than anything you have on your radar. You may not believe it, but that's part of what faith is about. It's believing that being a part of God's kingdom is better than what our goals and plans may be. So we deny ourselves. The God of the universe wants to use us to accomplish his goals. What could be better use of your life than that? That's what God is recruiting you to. Something way better than anything you have planned. Ephesians 2 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
Which that implies that if there are good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do, that implies that each of us, all of us, have been specifically designed, perfectly designed, to meet a particular need as a part of God's kingdom. Have you ever thought about that? You are perfectly designed to meet a particular need that God has prepared in advance for you to do because he wants you to be a part of his kingdom. Now, Caesarea Philippi and the whole self-indulgent life that it represents, you saw the ruin. Caesarea Philippi is gone. All of those people that spend all their time indulging themselves, it's gone. And what do they have left to show for it? Nothing. The Jesus movement is going strong. The Roman Empire and the Colosseums and the arenas and government and the entire Roman Empire way of life, for as great as it was, it's gone. There are only ruins left. And the Jesus movement is still going strong. Superpowers have come and gone. Superstars have come and gone. And the Jesus movement is still going strong. It's an eternal movement. You want to be a part of a never-ending movement? Follow Jesus the Messiah. It's not about us. It's about something much greater than us. Following Jesus the Messiah will also include suffering. There will be suffering. Jesus says, you want to follow me? Take up your cross. And taking up your cross is not a euphemism for something good. <laughs> okay, that's not, don't be... Okay, that sounds bad because it is. Following Jesus involves suffering. And sometimes we have this expectation that following Jesus means we won't have any trouble. See, I'm getting into trouble because I'm not following Jesus, so if I follow Jesus, God's going to stop zapping me. Okay? As if your troubles are caused because God's zapping you. Almost like following Jesus is an immunization shot from bad things. It's like the flu shot, okay? I follow Jesus, nothing bad will happen. I got the shot, I'm good. Jesus told his disciples, John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Following Jesus involves pain, it involves loss, it's costing us something. It's, again, we have to deny things in ourselves. Jesus told his disciples, you need to count the cost of what it will be to follow me. And the church has always had to suffer. The Jesus movement has gone strong for 2,000 years, and there's been suffering that's been a part of it the whole time. Today, we are labeled judgmental, intolerant, and narrow-minded. Sometimes that's fair. Sometimes it's completely unfair. Jesus said, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we shouldn't be surprised by the labels. We will have trouble. Following Jesus is also defined by serving. Jesus said, Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will save it. And that is more than just literally losing your life. 
Losing your life means self-denial and serving. That's what we're called to do. Jesus, in Mark 10, he says this. Jesus called his disciples together and he said, You know, those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Oh, and whoever wants to be first must be the slave to all. For even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's completely upside down from our expectations. You want to save your life? Give it up. You want to be great? Become a servant. You want to be first? Become a slave to everybody. It's upside down. But maybe it's not crazy. Think about it. Have you ever been in a tough spot? Like a kind of situation where you really need some serious help with something and you really don't know how this is going to work out. You don't see a solution. You need help. You're not sure where the help's going to come from. It's a big thing. It's almost too much to ask anyone or it's, it's one of those situations. You don't know where the help is coming from. Ever been in one of those situations? And then someone comes along and helps you. Maybe it's someone you know. Maybe it's someone you don't. But someone comes along and they help you and they get you out of whatever jam you were in. What do you say about that person? You say, man, you're a lifesaver. Why? Because they served you. And their service of you moved them right to the top. Lifesaver. I don't know how you get much higher than lifesaver on somebody's list. You want to become a lifesaver? Well, do something. Serve someone. Find something to do in service. Now, Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 10, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. For me, that's a warning to be wise in how we serve. So if we're going to serve and find ways to serve others and to become servants of others, we need to be wise in how we do it. And one thing I appreciate about Mustard Seed and even how we do things here at TFRC when it comes to helping people, we have a process in which we go about to help people. And the reason we have a process is because we want to make the most of our resources and be wise in how we serve. But even though we need to be wise in how we serve, we still need to do something. We need to find a way to serve someone, somewhere, Somehow. Romans 12, chapter, or Romans 12, verse 20, at least the first part of that verse, it says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Oh, and if you're, your enemy, if he's thirsty, well, give him something to drink. That's how we're supposed to treat our enemies. And we have enemies. I bet you you have enemies. You got a nemesis, got an enemy, <clears throat> got someone who's like a thorn in your side. Well, you know the best way to defeat an enemy? <clears throat> Turn him into a friend. <laughs> well, how do you do that? Well, you serve him. It's upside down, but it's not crazy. Again, we've been labeled judgmental, intolerant, narrow-minded. And maybe you will run into people that view followers of Jesus that way. 
Well, you know what we're supposed to do? Well, we serve them. And we serve them some more. 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 And do you know what will eventually happen? Sooner or later, in their minds, they'll be like, okay, I know that Christians and Jesus followers are intolerant and judgmental and narrow-minded, but man, you sure seem like a pretty good guy or gal to me. Sooner or later, it's going to register, wait a minute, what I've been told is not what I'm experiencing here. We need to do something. Find a way to serve. Somehow, somewhere, some way. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light shine, Jesus says. Well, how do you do that? Let your good deeds be seen. And when our good deeds are seen, God is eventually, sooner or later, glorified. Service, serving others, is a great weapon. It's a great weapon. Now, it's not a weapon that we use to overpower people by force. Service is not a weapon that we use to overpower people by force, but it's a weapon to overpower people with God's love. It's the greatest weapon, with the exception, I would say, of the Holy Spirit, God has given us. It's the strategy He wants us to use. Serve people. Serve one another. Serve others. Now, the world may have their own weapons. Maybe it's the media or the culture war or whatever. But when people experience God's love through our service, I don't care what the enemy has as a weapon. God will win. God's going to win. And he's got the great strategy. Get my people serving in the name of Jesus. And so when people see the good deeds that my people are doing, they're going to glorify me. By the way, the Jesus movement has been using that strategy for 2,000 years and has been winning every time they use it. A 2,000-year record. I like to... Um, and again, because of my schedule, I can take Fridays off, and so I like to help out at my kid's school. I know most of you can't do that, but that's just one thing I do for service. And great opportunities helping out my kid's school, and, and, and I respect the school boundaries. I'm not there to preach or do anything like that. I'm there to help out. And um, a week ago Friday, and I've been, again, helping go to my kid's classroom for years, reading in the classroom, that kind of thing. A week ago Friday, my wife and I were at the school um, science fair is coming up, and we cut like, I don't know, 210 pieces of cardboard for the science project display or something like that. It was Valentine's Day. I said, Shannon, I got a great way for us to spend Valentine's Day. Let's go cut cardboard at the school. It was terribly romantic. It was great, okay? And, um, and then after that, we, we changed the sign, the marquee sign at the school. We do that whenever the sign needs to be changed too. And it's brain-dead work. It's one of the things I love about it. You know, cutting cardboard, you have to think. You just cut, you know, try not to cut yourself, but you cut, and then you cut some more, and then you cut some more, and you cut some more, and it's just, it's brain dead. Same thing changes the sign. You really don't have to think about it. You got to make sure you spell correctly. But other than that, it's really not a, it's brain dead work. I do some of my best work when I'm not thinking. So I love this kind of volunteer work. I just, whatever. But we were changing the sign, and one of the teachers at school drives by and changes the sign. And she rolls down our win her window to, she's really nice and kind, and she wants to encourage us. And she says, you guys are great. You guys do everything around here. Now, she knows what I do for a living. And when she said that, the thought that came to my mind was, 
Yes. Another point for the kingdom. It's another point for the kingdom. Now you may say, okay, that's great. That's one point. <laughs> Look at all the points that we could have. And again, it's not about us. What's the enemy going to do to counteract that? And the answer is nothing. <laughs> There's nothing the enemy can do. That's why the enemy doesn't want us serving. We have to do something. Serve somewhere, somehow. And that's the challenge for the week. Your week eight good news challenge is to identify someone or someplace to serve. Now, here's how it works. For, you know, well, what do I have to do to get a sticker? I understand that's important for some of you. So here's, here's the sticker rule for the week, okay? It says identify someone or someplace to serve. What that means is maybe you identify someone or someplace to serve, but you don't get to that because of whatever, scheduling conflict or whatever. You don't get to it this week, but you've made a commitment. I'm going to serve at that place or serve at that person, and maybe I'll do it next week, but I've got it. I'm going to commit it to serving that place or that person somehow, somewhere. You have to identify it. If you don't get to it this week, you can still put on a sticker. But I want you to get, I want you to think, we want you to think service. Start looking at how you can serve. Identify a place you can serve. Figure it out. You don't actually have to do the service this week to get the sticker. Is that clear? Very important. Because I don't want people to be confused about the sticker. I hate getting questions. Now, I did this. Does that count for a sticker? I don't know. Go ask Pastor Brian. And he's not here this week, so you have to wait until he gets back. Okay? But there are all sorts of opportunities out there. You can serve at TFRC, the mustard seed, your neighbors, your coworkers, your friends, your family, the Salvation Army, Pregnancy Crisis Center. You could help out with the prison chaplain ministry. You could volunteer to coach. You could help out at a school. You could volunteer at the hospital. Do I need to go on? <laughs> And again, when you serve, you serve in the name of Jesus. The world is hurting. There is no shortage of needs. And people wonder, people wonder this. Is God going to do anything? Is God going to do something? And God sees the need, and he says, oh, I know exactly who I can get to do that. And then he comes to you. Because we are God's handiwork. Created to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So we are are the light of the world. And when we give up our lives to serve, we become a part of a movement that's been winning for 2,000 years. Let's do something.